Hey guys, Dan here, and uh, we've got Melissa and Tim over Zoom. Melissa, hello. Hello. Tim, how's it going, buddy? How are you, buddy? Uh, we are here to talk once again about the Wonder Years. This is now season five. We're almost finished. One more to go after this. Uh, Tim has been working long hours and said that it was a big chore to get through uh, this season. Uh, so I can't wait to hear his responses for some of these episodes. Was well, the long hours or the bad writing? <laughs> um, a little bit of both. I just, at that one point, I just felt like it was kind of like homework that I had to do. Um, I was like, oh, I have to watch five episodes so I don't watch 24 in one day. And we never want you to feel like that, Tim. We want you I to think feel I did it over three fresh. days. Definitely watch them pretty quickly. Now, see, I watch like one or two a day because we only do one of these every like month. So there you go. So the next one will be the last. So we're going to get it out before the end of the year. But now we're on season five. Um, Melissa already mentioned some writing issues. So I'm curious about that. Tim, did you star any of these episodes? Um, I mean, I starred two of my favorite of the season. Um, if I was comparing them to other starred episodes, they probably wouldn't have been starred. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's fair. Um, all right. So, well, let's just dive into it then. So this season obviously is a little bit of, uh, another dip. We had our peak at season three, uh, season four, a little bit less than that and five and six, um, maybe a bit less than that. I feel like that's always kind of an issue with, um, shows revolving around children because once they get to about 14 15 um the storylines become a bit i don't know let's say more repetitive and more basic and uh they're also not as adorable anymore because they're becoming you know jerky teenagers and we see some of that here i think um, well did either of you read there was something online about how they were supposed to they wanted to do more, but they wouldn't, the network wouldn't let them do racy enough episodes for their age. So then they kind of were like, okay, well, then I guess we're going to end it because, you know, we can't do anything else. We've done all these storylines. For, for the series as a whole, you mean? Yes. So like when they got to this, because we're going to end junior year, I'm assuming, we're in sophomore yes. year. Or I guess 10th grade now. So next yeah. year's 11th grade. And I would assume that then, that, then we know that's it. Um, yeah, um, I I am finished with, with season six. Um, so at some point, Tim and I can swap these DVDs off. Um, so I actually did finish it. I've been watching some of the bonus features for that. And um, yes, we could, we could certainly get more into that at uh, the end of season six. But yes, uh, there was some debate whether or not to continue the program. But yeah. Um, the creators decided that it was probably best to, to cut it where they left it um, because Kevin is basically sort of leaving the wonder years at this point and getting into more adult themed things. Um, we see a little bit of that here in season five, but in season six, um, you know, it gets, gets even uh, more sort of adult in the respect that like he has a, a job full time and, you know, not necessarily adult, adult things, but um you know, he's no longer a kid, obviously. Yeah, so I didn't dislike this season. I just felt like compared to other seasons, it's very episodic. There is not really much of a story arc throughout this season at all. I mean, the most story arc that you have is kind of the bookends of the lake, and that's about it. Um, but then, uh, like the the things that were going on i didn't mind those either it's just i felt like there was very little paul there was very little winnie like they were kind of absent the whole time it was all about kevin and that's okay but um some of these other characters like winnie and paul who are still credited as feature people i know we didn't see winnie that much in the previous season sometimes but i felt like she was absent for probably three-fourths of the season I yeah, think, um, I, I, I think I can speak to that um, based on some of the uh, bonus features here. But um, yeah, essentially, we had, we had talked um, in season one or two when we talked about Winnie 
um, and Danica McKellar's parents not wanting her to even be on the show in the first place and this and that. So once she got to high school age, um, and I don't know if this is the same for Paul Saviano and his family, but um, McKellar's mom was like, all right, you know, you're going way too hard on the show. I want you to have a normal life. We're going to, you know, kind of make you do way less episodes this season. And da, da, da. So as a result, yeah, we see a lot less Winnie. Um, she is back at the same school though, right? Yeah. Okay, yes, I thought so. But in this season, Paul right? goes to a different school. Paul at for the first, first half of the se- season. Yeah. As- and so I don't know, you know, if, if that has to do with that, but um, some of the friends that we met last season um, in, I guess, middle school, the end of middle school, like uh, Doug Porter, I don't think is in this season at all, no. right? The no. only kid that we sometimes see is one of those tall blonde kids who doesn't have much of a role. Yeah, you we know, see that- tall blonde a little bit and we see a lot of this uh, Ricky Holsenbacher yeah um in a few of these episodes he's sort of the new like buddy um and then yeah paul rejoins halfway through the year um yeah so like, yeah i mean uh dana mckellar really is not in this season very much yeah and when she is i feel like it's not really meaningful at all um and then for the buddies yeah doug Porter's not there that made me very sad they kind of replaced them with uh ricky house and back um but then you also have a new guy. His name is uh, Chuck Coleman. That's the guy that like twitches. Right. Um, yeah, Chuck. They met the in the soccer field. And both those guys, I think, are prevalent in season six. But the one guy, the tall guy that's been there, that's still is Randy Mitchell. That's the character's name. He, I think he's been there since season one. And he kind of just has a couple episodes here and there. But I felt like he was a little bit more prominent this season. So the interesting thing is, remember when we were talking last season about Kevin being the ringleader and some of those kinds of things? I think the interesting thing is, as we've gotten now to high school, we were talking about him being more of the like, you know, just average Joe, every man, not, you know, super cool. I feel like they get way dweebier and ridiculous and just, I don't say on the margins, but they don't really have a group. They don't have like a I mean, we ha- we see the soccer episode, but I mean, that's kind of minimal. We, we really don't see Kevin having this sort of place in high school, like not a, not a band kid, not a drama kid. Not He's just with this group of guys. I'm, okay, I'm really glad you said that because when we talked about season four and I was like, oh yeah, like I, you know, Kevin, I can't believe that that Madeline girl likes him. He's such a dweeb. And you guys were like, no, Kevin's really cool. Like he's whatever. I had already watched this season, so I guess I was getting them confused because, right, this season he really is kind of a goof. Him and his his goofy buddies, which is oh. how I was in high school. It's fine, I, you know. I was sort of, I I wasn't, you know, completely a, a, a loser. I wasn't really popular. I was just somewhere in the middle. But I had my core group of friends, and we were all kind of nerds and dweebs and whatever. Um, so I guess I was sort of blending the two seasons, which sometimes happens, but. But yeah, I completely agree. I think this group specifically, like Doug Porter was sort of this like lovable sort of nerd, but uh, Chuck and uh, and Ricky Holsenbach, it's like, man, you couldn't have plucked more dweeby people. But I think that's kind of a little bit realistic from going as the, like, because he's going from junior high to senior high, um, ninth grade, where he's like, probably in a little bit smaller school popular and now he's going to a bigger school and he probably gets less popular and I, I i understand why like friends kind of come and go when you do the, the transition so i understand why doug porter isn't there like it's very re- realistic but it also made me sad um yeah i agree i totally agree with that yeah my, my friends changed in high school a bit a couple of them i had kept with me but yeah some of them not so much yeah I actually kind of liked some of the school episodes more than I had previously. I know I complain usually about those. And I know you said that, Tim, that it was, you know, a little more episodic. Um, It was almost nice to be able to uh, pick up an episode. It reminded me a lot more of the 80s and 90s TV where you don't have these arcs 
And that was kind of re refreshing for me as someone who's so used to binging things. I didn't, even though I did sort of binge this, I didn't feel as much as I needed to like know a lot about necessarily what was happening. Maybe there'd be like two, like two episodes about something, but not, not this huge, like it wasn't the Winnie saga again. It wasn't, we had some car episodes. It wasn't necessarily the saga of any one thing. Yeah, and I, I didn't mind the episodic nature, and I felt like a lot of the stuff I could relate to as a, a high school kid. Um, but when you have two or three seasons where there's somewhat of a story arc going through, I mean, those other seasons were somewhat episodic as well, but there was like, oh, we'll come back to this, or we'll come back to that. And there was like the math teacher type of thing, or like, the Winnie kind of arc, but there was no Winnie this season. So there was no arc. And that's a little disappointing. You're used to that. Yeah. The only thing we, we really get, I guess, in terms of some kind of big arc in the same way, kind of as the math teacher, because they weren't um, episode after episode, but uh, the David Schwimmer and Karen uh, storyline, we yeah. sort of, we first, you know, met him at the end of last season and now uh, that sort of comes to a head, I think, in maybe three episodes. Might just be two. I think there's three, though, because the, uh, the the camping, camping outside in the yard, uh, the, the birthday dinner. And then the yeah. wedding. The wedding. And then it, okay, I couldn't remember since I'd seen season six. I couldn't remember if that was five or six. But OK, so we that's really, I, I guess, the only sort of through line for the season. It's not even uh, Kevin has almost nothing to do with it. That's yeah, true. The, the only other one is the lake, and it begins with the lake and basically ends at the lake without the clip show episode of him right being a girl. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, with that in mind, let's let's start tackling these episodes. I guess so. The lake is is first. Um, you've got uh, Lisa Gerber uh, reprising her role both in the beginning of the season and the end of the season here. Um, and this is is this what the the at least the second season where they started with a vacation episode. Maybe it's the third. The because hmm. the one where where uh, he met the other girl wasn't that the start of season three or two? I mean, we have started with a summer episode. I want to say every single season, even if it wasn't on vacation, we always start out in the summer. We don't okay. start out in the school yeah. in the school year. I don't believe at all. Which makes so sense. Except for season two, which was kind of a continuation of season one. Well, uh, yeah, yeah the, right, right, right. Because being, being that way. Yeah, no, I, I that makes sense. Um, I, I thought this was fine. I mean, you know, like like Tim said, I don't think any of these episodes, except for maybe one or two, really grabbed me in the same way that, uh, you know, the pottery episode did or goodbye or something. But, um, you know, I, I thought this was kind of cute. I feel like it's a bit of a retread of of the girl from the beach but he's a little bit older now so him and paul can actually like go out on their own and do things i think there was an interest so this this episode is the beginning of a motif that i don't know if you both noticed or not um of like references to greece did anybody pick up on that We've I got, only know Grease by the songs. I never really saw the the movie because I okay. the clips I saw I didn't care for. Paul talks about his twenty five cent insurance policy. We've got a whole stranded at the drive in thing, and that's the main things in this episode. But we as we go on, like there are other things that come up, and I was just like, what is going on here? The whole theme of the I've met this girl while I'm away, which is the whole premise of Grease. They've met at the beach, and it's just a summer fling, and uh, oh, like summer loving! Uh, wow, I, I I've not seen Greece, so I didn't even know they met on the beach. I thought they all went to the same school. Summer loving happens so shows fast. Up. She yeah. shows up at the school, but there's a couple uh, okay. other things we see a whole. There's another episode later, but anyway, um, it, it's just I would they they literally plucked phrases that you don't hear other places that I was like this is Greece. What are we doing here? So well, that was my purpose, big takeaway from the lake. Um, now that you mention that, I, I do see that. Um, I mean, the, the one episode that's very Greece-esque is uh, episode Frank four. Frank <laughs> uh, Denise. Denise. 
Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, that one's very, very grease heavy. I mean, she's or he's a greaser, basically. Um, well, and it's so, that yeah, whole that same it certainly Nikki picked up and Rizzo storyline about possibly being knocked up. So then I'm like, what? You're right. Wow. Okay. So the, the that had mooning, to be on purpose. The next episode, we've got the guys, the all the three guys, and they go mooning, and that's a whole thing. Yeah, the car episode. For their mooning. I mean, it just keeps going. So. Well, a full, full Moon Rising sort of reminded me of American Graffiti more than anything. Oh, absolutely. But it just was right. little pieces here and there that yeah. were like, wait a second. <laughs> Uh, yeah. All right. Well, what did, what did you think of these episodes? I, the, both oh. the back to the lake and the lake. Because back to the lake, he goes back. He's with Winnie, but I guess he's trying to whatever well, meet up with the girl again. That's that. That's the whole thing about that. The end of the season with the the back to the lake and then the clip show episode, uh, Broken Hearts and Burgers. Like at that point, like. He references Winnie in Back to the Lake as my girl Winnie, and then it's upset that she has a job and he doesn't have time for her. And I was like, when did she become his girl again? Like this whole season, I felt like they weren't together. Well, uh, I thought it was that um, double. It was date the car episode. crash. No, no, no. The car crash right? was last season. This is the double date episode where they, they decide they're going to date these other people. They're going to go on this double date. That's real awkward. They go to the dance and they leave each with each other at the dance. Oh, yeah. And then right. make out. But that's episode 16. We don't. I thought they were already together by again. then. I, I thought that the whole I love you outside the window uh, at the car crash last season. I thought that was the now we're back together. But they broke up like, again. I guess, right. Yeah. I guess that wouldn't make sense then if he went to the lake. All right. They, well, what, I don't know when that. said, I love you out the window, I don't think they were together again. I think they were just acknowledging that they still care about each other type of thing. Okay. Because, yes, I forgot a whole about the double date thing because that is episode 16. And then Winnie's not in it. I don't think until again in 23. So I got that basketball one where they're going to the basketball game and they're sitting together. I think they're supposed to be like together. It's just not hot and heavy. It's not the main piece of the story. Yeah. So if they are together, then that is very confusing for uh, back to the lake where he just kind of ditches Winnie and drives to go. What's the girl's name? Cara. Cara. Yeah. Yeah. Um, This one. Smack him. It's like you always say, Tim, like, it's like, you just, uh, what's he doing? Well, yeah. I was real mad at him this episode because he was, he was putting Paul's job on the line. Yeah. Oh he, yeah. He, Bad friend. He was being very selfish. And then when he gets there, he's like, oh, did you get my Christmas card? And he's like, yeah. And she's like, you never wrote back. And I was like, Kevin, you have to write back to these girls that are sending letters to you. Like, Real dummy. Yes. That's so we don't like her. We, we don't like these episodes then. I, want I, don't, to- I don't mind Kara. I think, especially the first episode, Lake, I in my mind that Winnie and uh, Kevin aren't together. They have a little fling. But the second episode where he goes back to her, like, Kevin doesn't have any right to do that because apparently he's with Winnie and he's ruining Paul's job career. And I don't blame Kara at all. I blame Kevin. Yeah, I so. actually like Kara. She she was a good uh, good girl. And he didn't write her back. So what did he honestly expect? Yeah. And she has a boyfriend and tells him and is very pretty much honest about, yeah, I can't really do anything with you. So well, all the way. Look, you said it, bad friend. What else, what else can we do? All right. So uh, then we get to the school episode. Day one, oh. his first day in high school. One uh, thing, Tim, uh, it, like in the lake, um, they introduced new character that we didn't know. Uh, Wayne's friend, Wart. Um, yes, <laughs> he will factor in uh, much more a little bit later. But yes, this is the first episode with good old Wart. And, I, and he's in day one as well. And I, I do like his character. He basically repeats everything that Wayne says. And I, I find that humorous. Um, so, well, Wayne yeah. finally has, uh, yeah, like somebody who will actually, 
who actually thinks he's cool and who actually like sort of looks up to him. Like he's a big loser at home. He's a big loser at school. Now he's got this sort of mimic. Um, yeah. Yeah. So they're I, day one as well. And Kevin uh, is going to high school for the first time thinking that's going to be great. And it's, it's not so great for him. Um, he's getting bullied by his brother and Wart for standing on the seal. And then he has uh, that jerk teacher. Um, I forget. Yeah, I hated that guy. Um, and. Oh, and again, that dumb friend, Kirk, that kid Stewart. Oh, yeah. I, I thought. Oh, maybe- yeah. The only episode we see Stewart in. Yeah, I thought I, he was going to be in, end up being in the friend group after you had said, oh, he gets a whole new group of friends. I was like, oh, maybe this is going to be one of them, especially when he, uh, you know, stands up for Kevin a little bit at the end. I did like the end of this. I, I thought this was uh, the, when they all rip the pages from their books and everybody does it. I thought that was um, uh, it, it redeemed the episode a little bit. Yeah, I always liked that part, uh, you know, where he just does it. The, the the ripping out of the spiral notebook is one of these the, the teacher's biggest complaints and what a jerk teacher i didn't care for him yeah and and like it's a complete 180 from the teachers in in middle school like ben stein is very monotone but he's enjoyable um and then all his teachers that he had relationships with uh miss white or whatever her name is later um and then the math teacher and even uh coach cutlet like I feel like the teachers be in high school were non-existent. I feel like this is the only teacher that they really even tackled. Um, I feel like that was a little. We have wild. a whole episode with that one teacher. Oh, that teacher, yeah. Uh, the Coda, Coda yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then she leaves too. So I mean, <laughs> Miss Shaw. Um, well, listen, Melissa, as a, uh, a high school teacher, how do you feel about these depictions? Because right. All the middle school teachers seem very caring and, you know, let's, you know, we're doing it for the kids. And these, uh, this, this guy seems like a real jerk. Um, so there are teachers, a few teachers who have some of the, like some of these hang up things. I think they've exaggerated him a little bit. Um, I don't think anybody is quite that jerky that that I've seen in this day and age, but years ago, probably. Um, yeah, probably in the seventies. Good power trip. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I honestly, the Miss Shaw, I had way more to say about um, because uh, while I agreed with a lot of the things she was doing, um, I just really didn't believe that anybody that passionate about their students would leave mid-year like that. You know, and this is a trope that they've done over and over again. My so-called life did an episode with it and it's always an English teacher. Um, You know, they're always the, the, uh, the let's do things outside of the box and and whatever. Um, Yeah. I mean, she really was, was holding to her principles and, uh, and you shouldn't hold to your principles but they were going to let her still sort of play within the system a little bit and she can like a good teacher will still take the curriculum and your parameters and do something with it to like inspire you like she could have done so much with them and then at the end of the year yeah then leave you know but the abandoning that impressionable group in, I, I just, I was so, I was saying, I was like, if this is the kind of teacher you are, then you would not leave these kids at this point. And so I was very upset with that just because even I even a young teacher true. like her. I mean, maybe that's the difference, but I think even as a young teacher, I was, I was always very, uh, you, you, your students always come first. Like you, you bust yourself like killing yourself doing things that you're people are like why are you doing that and it's always for the kids and I was like this doesn't seem like you're doing anything for the kids this seems like it's all for you and your agenda is this kind of like that lit mag guy from uh what season three or something where he wanted them all to protest and then when it came down to it he was like well I, I'm out guys like I can't be a part of this anymore da, 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 da. was it kind of like that you think well I think that teacher lost his job like I could remember, I 
I think that's what happened. Like they, they removed him. And I kind of was under, I didn't know if this one, uh, Miss Shaw, if she was, did get fired and she just kind of was playing it off that she wasn't getting fired for the kids. Like, I'm not sure. Like, I don't think she would have lied to them. I think she would have said, I got fired and, oh. and then blamed the administration. Oh, no, I, I I actually agree with Tim. I was under the impression she was fired because she wouldn't conform. Oh, yeah, right? they gave her an ultimatum, absolutely. Yeah. It was, you conform, you teach the curriculum, which, again, you kind of, if you're in public school, you kind of have to do. Um, so. So, yeah, I, may, may, I mean, maybe, it, you know, she said I quit, but, yeah, I feel like the ultimatum um, was certainly there. I, I, I felt like she kind of got ousted by not conforming. Yeah, and I think maybe like she seemed to be like the type of person that didn't want to budge and that maybe they, in her mind, they would budge first. And that's how I thought it happened was like, they were like, hey, conform. And she's like, no, I'm not going to conform. This is what I'm doing. And then they were like, oh no, then you're done type of thing. I would be interested if they had cast the teacher as a different race, because she was, um, you know, a black teacher, if they would have done something different, or if this was, you know, sort of a, I mean, this is, this is the late, what year is this supposed to be? Seven, this is 71, 72 school year. Yeah, I mean, some schools have recently in the last, you know, few years desegregated. So, I mean, I just, there was some yeah. interesting, like, well, we, if, we know someone very well who, uh, is what the the first teacher of color at uh, her school ever i think or at least currently um and i certainly didn't true? have any yeah oh yeah oh that's true all right uh and i didn't i only had one my entire school career until i got to college and in, in See, I elementary school. middle school high school i only had one african-american teacher uh, I believe there was an Asian teacher. I didn't have them, but they were there. But that was it. And that was in the 90s. In Maryland, we had a lot. I mean, my fourth grade teacher. Oh, okay. Was, there were a lot. There were a lot of African-American black teachers. Yeah. Um, but in the South, I don't I think we only had one African-American student in my elementary school in Connecticut. So, I mean. Well, that yeah, right. That stands to reason. Um, I don't but, like think you said that American teachers in my my high school or middle school yeah i'm surprised i didn't have more i mean i i was living in a philly suburb i mean I, you know i don't know but um yeah i mean we we had a lot of diverse kids but in terms of teachers yeah i, I really think uh we only had the one in the whole high school um so yeah i, I don't know how that would have played differently uh melissa if, if she were white uh in this episode um, but all right, so let's move on here to the hardware store. Um, this is where, uh, Kevin has to decide basically between, uh, making a living working for this old guy who's nice enough, but, um, his store basically has no business anymore. He's kind of a, an old timer in the, in the, in the game. Um, and he's trying to teach Kevin a good work ethic. I kind of like this one. Um, kind of surprised by uh kevin's dad's reaction when uh, they needed a washer and uh he he himself was even like oh i'm not going to go down to old man uh, whoever's store i forget the name of the uh, the guy but um because you know he'll talk your ear off and i'll just i'll just go to the their version of walmart or whatever uh and get it there i thought that was uh kind of surprising but of course jack's time is precious so it makes sense um but yeah, I like this one. Um, I, I, think I, I did like it. Um, I kind of was also annoyed at Kevin at the end because I, at the, like, I thought that when that lady came in and she helped and he helped her and like he knew the information because he was learning stuff that he was going to be like, okay, I'm going to stick with this job. We're just just not going to show it anymore. Um, but no. He, uh, he left and then he got a job at the mall and then he also quit that job in a month. Um, so once again, it's a great episode, but I just was disappointed with Kevin's decision-making. 
But but don't you think that makes it realistic, Tim? You and I worked uh, together with a lot of first job people, and they were just a lot of some of them were great. And some of them were very fly by night, you know, and that was in a fun job. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's very realistic. Um, but after four seasons, I feel like Kevin was maturing and being a little bit more adult. Um, and I just feel like a couple of these episodes, he's, he's, he's regressed a little bit. <laughs> Well, okay. I think this Alyssa? is sort of a stick it to dad a little bit because dad got him the job. And so, as you say, becoming a little more independent and mature, I think as a, so I, I never worked any sort of retail, mall, fast, I didn't do any of that. I only ever worked with like children's camps or I worked at my dad's office. So it was that whole someone got me the job kind of thing. So I better do a really good job. And I think being, I think being a girl and not necessarily having that, like I need to get out on my own sort of thing, like Kevin did and like not really caring if it was, you know, all that cool. Um, uh, I, I, it was a different dynamic. Like there was no way I was leaving that job where he's like, like dad you got me this job it's boring and then it's a do as i say not as i do he's not even getting the washer there so it was basically a oh i basically have permission to be independent but also i mean he even says it to the guy that he's clearly not needed there you know nobody comes in there and and the wife understands she's like oh you know just just let him go then you know whatever um i mean I, I kind of did get it because I think he was just bored to tears at that job. Yeah, but I, I also felt like the guy was like, oh, I'll give you extra money to stay here. And I was like, this guy just really is looking out for Kevin. And it just, I guess that's, I more relate to that guy because of, I was in that position of like bending over backwards to try to get people to work at our job. And then they would I'd go through all the paperwork and then they would quit after two days. And I'm just like, it was, I just, I think that's who I relate to. And there's well, that okay. That was frustrating for you, Tim, as hiring manager, that's for sure. But I actually didn't look at it like that. I thought not, a, not that he, you know, didn't, wasn't looking out for Kevin necessarily, but I thought he was trying to keep Kevin around just because he was lonely and wanted, you know, somebody there, the companionship, because nobody was coming in to talk to you anymore. Right. That's how I always thought. But somebody. he, I mean, he was throwing money at the, at, at him basically at the end. And I totally understand the whole, the job is, is boring. Listen, I was getting paid like $12 an hour to remove staples from papers so they could go through a scanner. I wasn't even doing the scanning. I was literally like, taking pa staples out and cutting the paper in half so somebody else could skip. I mean, talk about boring. What but a life. I had security. You could take off if you needed to. Like, you had a doctor's appointment. Like, I was much more about the, this is not too hard. I don't care how fun it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, but at this point, I mean, he, do he doesn't drive yet, does he? Or he does he? No. Not yet. He he doesn't, right? So it's not like he needs money to get around and for gas and all that stuff. I feel like that's the time a lot of kids get a job. So I feel like he didn't necessarily need the job. Well, he was just, and his dad was kind of making it. He's not saving money for a car, which is what a lot of kids do at that age. Right, right. Uh, all yeah. right. Well, that's the hardware store. I still liked um, it. It's still a good episode. Yeah, I and think I, I, it's one of my favorites probably of the season, um, I think. All right, so Frank and Denise is next. We talked a little bit about that. Any more thoughts on, uh, I mean, nobody's really in it, but Kevin and then these two people. It's terrible. What the, is the point of this episode? <laughs> I, I don't it think it's seems, terrible, but it's, it seems it's, like a backdoor pilot for something else. I was, what was this? Yeah, it doesn't really go anywhere. Talk about, Tim mentioned it, talk about a standalone episode. You know, you could never watch this show before or since and be all caught up with the things. Was there, a, let me look, maybe there was some kind of B plot we missed here. No, not really. Okay. 
<laughs> yeah, that's it. We never see these people again. They're not in season six, whatever. Um, yeah, I don't know. So worst of the season for you, Melissa? Uh, I don't, maybe. Wow. I'm just not invested, and I thought it was horrible. These names, they were like, the, their nickname, it, just, it was all horrible. Frank the know. Tank and Denise the Grease? No, Frank the Stank. Oh, that's right. Frank the Stank. Frank the Tank, I think, was old school, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, All right. So <laughs> Frank the Stank and Denise the Grease. All right. These are not your uh, your great characters. So let's we'll leave it there. All right. So <laughs> Full Moon Rising is next. This is, uh, let's see. Oh, this is the mooning episode. A lot of mooning yeah. went here. Were they also drag racing at one point in this one? Well, they were sort that's of, another Grease motif. Uh, yeah, I guess that's true. They were uh, kind of being taunted to drag race, and I think they uh, chickened out. Right? I, yeah. Um, so who was the driver? This is, is, is Ricky the driver? Is that why Ricky's part of our lives now? Yes. Ricky's the driver. This is the episode that Ricky was introduced. Um, Randy Mitchell's there, and then some other kid that we only see in this episode. Um, Purdell. Yeah. He, he's uh, the kid with the glasses. Um, right. This is when Ricky can't remember any of the answers and somehow he still passes. Uh, yeah. Which made me angry because I it took me three. No, I failed three times. It took me four times to get my license. And this idiot passed on the first time. Hated yeah. that. I mean, it, it, it's 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 just the plot of the episode. I mean, oh, it's no, not... listen, I know some real dummies that got it on the first try, too. So I, I it's, it's I get it. It's realistic. I feel like a lot of it depends on, uh, you know, the mood of your instructor that day. Um, yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I, I, w I thought that was kind of relatable. I feel like when uh, me and my buddies, we first got our, our driver's license, I was I or when my my buddy was the first one to get a driver's license, we wouldn't do anything. We would go in the car and we would drive around because we could. And I feel like that's this episode. It's very relatable. Um and there's there's some yeah, all the time we did that all the, the first person to get their license every Friday night. He would pick everybody up round robin at like seven thirty, eight o'clock, whatever. And yeah, we would just drive for three or four hours. Sometimes we'd end up at a Denny's if we got hungry and then drive some more. So, yeah, I, I totally get it. Were different where I grew up because you could not if you were. You could get your permit at 15 and nine months and you could get your license at 16 and one month, but you couldn't drive after midnight, but you couldn't drive anybody in the car with you until you were like, until your provisional license was up. So there was this whole thing where people couldn't ride and like you couldn't only, you could only drive siblings if they were like under 18, it was a whole thing. So we uh, couldn't I, really drive around and do this. I know there are, different rules for uh permit people and maybe under 18 people but i feel like once you have your license maybe you can't drive after midnight unless you're over 18 but uh i i feel like yeah pa as long as you had your license you could drive whoever you wanted in, in pa right now with a junior's license you have to be off the road by 11 o'clock unless you're coming from work um yeah only... UPA was earlier because people had said things about 11 i was like oh my curfew on the weekend was midnight i remember trying to like slide in right at 11 45 to make sure i had a good buffer but yeah but you can drive whoever you want right tim yeah you can drive whoever you want yeah. um have your permits you have to be driving with someone who's an adult um in pa now you have to have your permit for six months but when I was in high school, um, you didn't have to do that. You could get your permit exactly when you're 16. And then when you're the next day, you could pass your driver's license. Oh, my um, God. And, oh, but no, that's then when I was in high school, there was a big story about this 16-year-old a kid. I don't know if it was a girl or a guy, but th that was what they did. And then they got in an accident and it was... I don't know if they died or if they killed someone, but it was a deadly accident. And then PA was like, uh, we're going to make sure everybody has their permit for six months now. So. Yeah, I think that's what it was by the time I got mine. 
because I was yeah. 18 but when I got mine. But now, uh, but back then, you could get your, I think you could get your driver's license on, on your 16th birthday. Yeah. See, I think we had something called, a, like, so you had, we're talking about permits. I think there was something called a provisional license after that. And that was the, and this is, this is when they would have it. These real young age kids would have that where you weren't allowed to drive people. So I definitely could drive people later, but this seemed not realistic to me. <laughs> So oh much. no, I think this, this is very realistic, especially this guys. Like, this is what yeah, guys I think did, it's a guy man. Thing too. Yeah, yeah. I I would definitely say so. Um, and uh, all right, any other thoughts on this one? Kevin gets kind of mad at everybody in this one. He calls everybody idiots. Well, because well, they run out of gas. Like, come well, on. he had a date with a girl, and they forced him to cancel it, and then he met up with her. And- Got caught in his lie about his grandma's liver or something like that. <laughs> That's um, right. I mean, it was it was it was funny, but I I understand why he was mad because they weren't doing anything. And but then by the end of the episode, he was like, "This is a great time," and that's what we did every Friday night. So like, I mean, yeah, he got mad, but then he eventually realized that this is great times. All right, I think Tim and I liked this one. Yeah, it was, it was I very, think that, it was very fun. fun. Yeah. I, I did. All right, so, better, actually. I, All right, so Triangle is next. Uh, this is where we meet, uh, what, Carla? Is this the Carla Gugino one? Um, yeah. So we see young Carla Gugino, who we, we know, all know and love now. Um, as, as Wayne's girlfriend, there is a love triangle because she actually kind of wants Kevin. Uh, Kevin is nursing a broken heart, and she's like, oh, well, you're – the the bee's knees um i actually really liked kevin in this one tim we we always talk about how kevin's a bit of a jerk sometimes and very selfish we've said it tonight many times um but he really i think stepped up in this episode he looked out for his brother now he did the wrong thing a lot of times but then at the end of the day he he came around and he let wayne uh he he allowed wayne to pretend that, she, that he broke up with her and that he didn't let on that he knows the real story or anything. I thought that was pretty nice. Uh, so uh, maybe a little back and forth on, on Kevin on this one, but um, yeah. Thoughts, Tim? You like this one? <laughs> um, I Yes, I will agree with you that this is very typical Kevin behavior of where we saw him in the earlier seasons of making some poor decisions and then eventually making the correct decision um so i think that's a great outcome and it definitely showed the camaraderie between him and his brother about like yes they don't always get along but um sometimes they can yeah i like this one a lot i think that the this is another daniel stern directed one um and i I felt actually like the arc of this season, the strong part of it was the Wayne Kevin relationship. I really enjoyed, I I don't know, even though Wayne was still a brat pretty much the whole season, he was, I was, I I, I found myself laughing at him more than being annoyed by him. Yeah. I I feel like their dynamic has changed from just sort of bully and bullied to actual like, brothers and people who care about each other we've seen glimpses of this in other episodes um but this is this is something that that happened sort of in a roundabout way to me so i always related to this episode it wasn't that i was hooking up with this chick but um i was friends with this girl that my brother then ended up dating and when they broke up i had to basically choose my brother over her um which you know was was not uh you know fun but um but yeah it was so i i always sort of related to this episode in a roundabout way yeah i think it was a good good high school episode as well yeah uh, again you know like we like most of these it relates to nothing else that's ever happened we never see carly gagino again <laughs> But uh, speaking of relating to nothing that ever happens, this next one. I know, I know. All right. I really wanted this soccer thing to kind of go somewhere. Um, I really liked this episode and I liked Paul Dooley as the coach. And there were a lot of things going on. 
Um, and so Ke Kevin decides to go out for soccer um, and you know, he's okay and everybody else is terrible. But I, I just thought it was a really cute episode and I wanted to see more of that. But there's not much to I it. Love the, I love that Pops was there when Jack was there. Oh yeah. Old man Pops. I had, there were a couple of teachers in both middle school and high school, I think more in high school, um, that my mom had 20, would have been 26 years or something earlier um, that were still there and they retired within a few years after that. But um, yeah, it was kind of funny to hear like her stories about them versus what I knew them as. We had yeah. a couple people like that, but since I didn't grow up around there, I didn't have that experience. Okay. I didn't have that experience because I didn't go to the same school as my parents did. Um, but I, I, I agree. This is a, this is a fun episode. Um, this is where we meet Chuck Colbin. And I think, I think that's the only thing that comes out of this episode is that we are introduced to Chuck and then he's, he's prominent as a friend of Kevin later on. Um, I, I do agree that it would have been nice to, maybe talk about soccer at some point the rest of the, the school. have them carry a ball or wear <laughs> yeah. the uniform like go into practice nothing I, ever it, no. i don't i think i don't think they ever played again is what it seems like probably like, got they got killed um but i think it would have been great to have a later episode where like they are somewhat improved or something like that and it like just a throwaway line or something like that um but yeah, um, I, I think that the way they handled this sport of soccer was a lot better than how they they handled the episode of like basketball at gym class type of thing where they just had like a 10 minute montage of them being bad at uh, like basketball. They, they did a little bit better in this of them. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Of all the sports episodes we've had so far, I think it's probably this one and maybe the one where Paul makes the basketball team. Yeah. That was a um, good one. That are that are I, I think probably the, the pinnacle. Yeah, this one seemed a little more well rounded than let's just have an eight minute montage, like like Tim said. Um I, what surprised me here was the fat the little known sport of soccer. I grew up in the 90s i did not play soccer but my sister did that really seemed to be exploding and now every kid plays soccer first i so give me the boy sporty and like earlier perspective of so that. um i only the only thing i knew about soccer when i was in middle school high school was pele there was a guy named pele very famous soccer player this was before david beckham this is before all of that um but Right. All of my any any foster kids or adopted kids that we had post 98 or so, they all played soccer. It was the biggest sport. And I don't know if that was specifically the, the Beckham effect. But yeah, when I was a kid, I mean, soccer existed, but people didn't really play it. We had a team, I guess. <clears throat> Tim? I played soccer when I was a kid. Did you? I, okay. I, I didn't play in school. Um, I tried out for the school team in middle school, but there was just like a kind of like type of T-ball type of program for soccer. Like it was just something did during the summer. I think I did it in the fall as well, but it wasn't through school. Um, we just have, we would have practice sometimes at night and then on the weekends we have games. So okay. um, yeah, I mean, I feel I like we found that in super gym. interesting. Um, but Tim, again, you're like six, seven years younger than me. So that actually yeah. does kind of make sense. Cause by the time I was finishing high school, getting into college, soccer was definitely coming up. Yeah. Um, well, I do want to point something out about this episode. So this was directed, uh, by this guy, Thomas, Thomas Schlamme, who, uh, in the industry goes by Tommy Schlamme. And he is, uh, a renowned director. This was one of his first gigs because he's more known for, working with Aaron Sorkin, he invented the old Sorkin walk and talk. No way. From Yes, from directing on the West Wing and he directed Sports Night and Studio 60 and all, all of the, the Sorkin shows. So he basically invented that whole walk and talk uh, thing. Don't they kind of do that in this episode when they're- A little bit. I actually was looking then, for it once I found out he directed it. 
yeah, they, yeah, they're at the trophy case and he walks him back to the, uh, the locker room. Yeah. The coach and, and, and Kevin. So interesting. So, I I'm surprised they didn't mention that in the commentary. That was just, I just knew the name from other shows I'd seen him work on, but, um, well, you have but to yeah, have the right commentators who know these kinds of things to be able to make the, you know. Well, connection. yes, this is this is true. Uh, all right, so next we get to a Schwimmer episode. So let's talk about all the Schwimmers right now. Um, so dinner out. This is Jack's birthday dinner. Um, David Schwimmer uh, plays whoever. What's his name? I know him as Schwimmer. Uh, <laughs> Michael. 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 Um, all right, so the three episodes from this season, like I said, we met them before last season, but dinner out, then you've got, uh, what's the the camping Stormy. one? Stormy, Stormy weather, weather, and then the very next one after that's the wedding. Yes. So those those two are right in a row. Um, do we, we like uh, Michael, we like David Schwimmer. We sort of touched on this last season, I know, but um, the, the, the episode where um, he camps out on the front lawn and Jack has a different understanding of him. That is certainly my favorite of the Michael episodes. I was a yeah. little bored in that episode just because it wasn't doing much for a while, but I think the whole arc is fabulous and I love Michael. Yeah. Yeah. I I I, I like Michael. I like David Swimmer's character of portrayal of Michael. Um I think he's good for, for Karen. Um, and I mean, it may like his arc of getting Jack's acceptance because um, he wants to not quote live in sin anymore and marry Karen. Um, and then she doesn't and want, wants to break up with him type of thing. Um, and once Jack finds that out, like his viewpoint of Michael completely changes and it, it, it's nice to see. Another great line read from Dan Laria when Schwimmer says, that's not what I wanted for us either. And he, he's, the camera just zooms in and he's like, what did you just say? Love that. <laughs> Chills every time. Um, so just, uh, um, David uh, Schwimmer course, does. Of course you think your daughter is not the issue. She's totally the issue. And I, well, I, I and like I, that. I think deep down though, I mean, look, Jack knows that she is a difficult free person. Spirit. Yes, a free spirit. They've certainly butted, butted their own heads. But I think, yeah, I for some reason in Jack's mind, I guess he associates, you know, this Michael with like corrupting her even further or, you know, because we got that with the uh, John Corbett character back in season two. Yeah. But, um, but so Schwimmer uh, does a, a, like a 15 minute interview in this box set. Um, and one of the things that I thought was very interesting that he said was he 100% feels that his gig on the wonder years got him friends, not because of people noticing him, but it, allowed people to see him as a romantic lead. And he said he doesn't think that ever would have happened without the relationship he had with Karen and able to show his, you know, more sensitive side because he admits in the thing, he's not, you know, the most attractive person out there. Uh, I, I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. I mean, I totally see it. I mean, there's definitely like a Ross Rachel type of relationship there, like type of thing. Like, um, I feel like he's playing kind of like not Ross ish, but I mean, I could see it. I could see early Ross, you know, how he, where yeah. he's getting divorced and he's kind of like a little downtrodden. Um, and you know, that's kind of what's happening here. Very in love. Um, just trying to make things work. I, I, I not the caricature, Red well, we can all admit once it, hits, once it hits about season seven, we all know everyone's just one note on that show, and that's fine. Um, but yes, the more the more like sad sack Ross of the earlier years. Um, so yeah, I love that. I like uh, you know the dinner episode that, that we're that. talking about here. I don't know why um, I love it so much. I think out of the three, that might have been my favorite one. It was so funny, and I don't I don't know. Just Kevin was really trying to. Uh, you know, be, be a big man and like pay for dinner. And then it just turned out to be this huge disaster. 
I think it reminded me a lot of um, my, like, not my own family necessarily, but like, I've done the whole, oh, I have to get him a gift. What can I do for the, you know, give your dad a gift. It's his birthday. Right. The, the boyfriend being there, that just the whole, that dynamic. I, I, I don't, I don't relate to Karen at all because I'm not necessarily Karen's type of woman, but being the oldest girl, I kind of relate to that paving the way situation. Yeah. And how about that? When he's camped out outside, nobody wants to, uh, you know, talk to, talk about it, talk to Karen about it. I thought that was weird. I was surprised Jack didn't sort of, I don't know, be more forceful, but then at that point he, he already liked him. And so, you know, he was going to let it happen, I guess, and watch it unfold. Yeah. Cause I, I think um, by that point, like Jack's relationship with Karen is always, he, he, he always wants her to be his little girl. Um, type of thing that's very evident in dinner out episode is because like he's very mad at her but like once uh norma says oh karen's gonna be there and he's like oh okay and he's like but and, but then he's like oh i can't have him in this house and she's like uh, what uh wayne was like why don't we go out to eat and he's like okay that's a loophole type of thing um and then at the end of that episode when after the whole big fight when she comes and knocks on the door and they have that moment. Um, like, I think he handles Karen a lot different than he handles uh, Wayne and, and Kevin. Um, yeah, for I think, sure. I think that's just his way of handling Karen in that moment is because he knows that Michael is in the right here and Karen's wrong and in the past he would just yell at her and I don't, I think he's learned that that's not how to handle Karen. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And then uh, for the wedding episode, I thought that was okay. But then I love the end, how we learn that uh, Michael's going to step up with the job here, but it's in Alaska. And so they have to go. And I just, I love that, uh, you know, at first Jack and, and Norma just can't believe it. Jack gives this amazing speech that sort of gets cut off by this news uh, written on the cake and then we learn that it reminds jack of taking norma away from her family you know hundreds of miles away i thought that was a nice sort of full circle type of thing for the family yeah, yeah. all right so up next is uh let's see christmas party um i don't think there's a, a ton fun. to talk about with this one but this is the one where uh they have the the famous Arnold Christmas party that we've never heard about in five years. <laughs> but uh, every I enjoyed year they... it. It was another one of those throwbacks to my, my childhood of having to collect the coats. My dad actually would pay us at one point. For, at first, it was just a cute thing. And then he would pay us. And then he would actually hire my sister to work the party. Um, wow. at the end. And then eventually it fizzled out because they didn't kind of not because of not like this with everyone having a fight. But, um, you know, it, it was it, I, I felt very nostalgic watching it. I totally see that with your dad. We never did anything like that. We didn't go to Christmas parties. We didn't hold Christmas parties. We went out to a movie on Christmas Eve. We played games all night and then we went to bed. That was our big Christmas uh, festivity. This was the annual tree viewing party. <laughs> he would get the ugliest tree. He wow. He would pay the least amount of money he could. He tried to pay like under $10 for a tree. And then he'd invite, it used to be family and friends, and then eventually it became coworkers. And it was his gift to his employees. And then it kept getting smaller and smaller. And I think last year with COVID, they had a maybe a rotating brunch where like one couple came in at a time and oh, uh, they uh, sat across the room from each other with their masks on. Tim, big uh, Christmas party family? Um, we we wouldn't have like a like a like a neighborhood party or anything like that. But at one point growing up, we would have like a, my mom's side of the family is really big, and we would have like a family holiday party. It was like somewhere Christmas and New Year's. It would be like somewhere around there, um, and that was that kind of reminded me of that a little bit. Um, just, yeah, I guess when I was real little, we did have. Uh, at my mom's parents' house, we did have a big family 
dinner uh, that wasn't necessarily on Christmas, right? But it was like during that week or something. So I guess we we did that a little bit. But yeah, once I was in about middle school, we we didn't do that anymore. Yeah, I mean, we did that for like for a while. Eventually, my mom's side of the family just got way too big for it to be held at any house, like during the holiday season. Like, oh wow. Well, all right. Uh, have we gotten to any of your start episodes yet, Tim? Uh, no. Okay. All right. Well, maybe maybe it'll be uh, Pfeiffer's Fortune, uh, where Jack uh, refuses to go in on a deal with the Pfeiffer family, and then they, you know, explode in the stock market, and then it all gets taken away eventually uh, with, uh, you know, the, the volatile nature of the stock market. Um, but this is the first really big Paul episode we've had the whole season. I, I think this is like the second time he showed up this season, probably. I guess that's true. Yeah, you're right. Because he wasn't even in the car, when, right? When they were doing the car ride, he wasn't Well, because he's been at prep school until yeah. now. Now that they oh, that's have right. that's their right. money on oh. this real estate right. deal where the beach is underwater or whatever it is, it was it very isn't, weird. This, isn't this what brings him back to public school is that they lose the fortune, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is more a a parents episode than anything, although Kevin and Paul do go at it, um, which I think is interesting, but we've, we see that about once a season. So I don't know. I I thought Kevin was being a little bit of a jerk again. Yeah. I don't Um, have to say here, honestly. Um, The thing I have to say is that, um, I thought it was an okay episode. Um, it, feels like it's very sitcom of like the the one family has money and another one doesn't and causes tension type of thing my problem with this episode is that it takes place directly after the christmas episode but yet somehow they're going to a country club and they're swimming in pools and they're playing tennis and this is supposed to be in the middle of winter and that's the reason paul goes back to oh. pirate just doesn't make sense interesting Interesting. Because they, they live in California and nobody wants to admit it. No, we, they, we figured out they don't. We they figured out that's a lie. Or they live in New York or something, right? Around us, and it just doesn't make sense. They don't know what Mid-Eastern winners look like, apparently. <laughs> All right. I mean, yeah, well, I didn't, I didn't think of that, but that is a good point. All right. So the next two uh, have to do with cars, road tests, and grandpa's cars. So we'll sort of talk about those together. Kevin is uh, going for his license test in uh, road test. And then grandpa's car um, is when they have to take the car away from, from grandpa Arnold because uh, he keeps getting in accidents. Um, road test is to me, not very memorable of an episode, um, well, but I well, love the grandpa's car episode. Um, road test has a very young Alicia Silverstone in. Yes. Oh, that's right. This is the one with little Alicia Silverstone. Very good. We love her. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's the only thing I can remember. Uh, well, actually, I can kind of relate to this because um, of the parallel parking. Um, Kevin struggles with parallel parking. Um, I learned how to parallel park, and then I didn't have to do it um, for a while when I was doing my permit or anything like that. And then all of a sudden, my dad was like, hey, I scheduled your uh, driver's license test today. I was like, I haven't practiced parallel parking in months. I don't remember how to do it. And he's like, oh, I'll teach you. And he had trash cans set up. And like, th- I kept hitting the trash cans because he had them too close together. There was no way to get in there. And then I went and failed my driver's test because I couldn't parallel park. And then my dad didn't teach me. My uncle Mike taught me how to parallel park after that. And he's like, this is how you do it. I was like, oh, and I kind of related to Jack teaching uh, Kevin Hallow Power Park. This parallel parking thing was what almost everybody failed in Maryland on because there's not really that many places to parallel park where we live. It's not that kind of area unless you live in the city. And so you had to go and practice, like you said, not necessarily with trash cans. They had places with cones that you could go and practice. And I actually, I did... I did pass both my tests on the first try, but the guy said that I was very lucky because I was talking back to him too much because I was so flustered. I kept getting like defensive. Um, But when I actually moved to where I lived 
for the house I'm currently in, that was an in-town parallel parking situation, and I'm actually really good at it now. That's yeah, I I failed one of my tests from parallel, um, and I have since taught at least three people from scratch how to do it, um, I- including our good friend Sam, because she didn't get her license till she was like twenty something. So uh, I'm not sure how to teach someone to do it. Like it's very yeah. muscle memory for me. Like I can't. I don't know if I can explain the mechanics well. Yeah. Um, all right. So yeah, I, I admit the parallel parking. That's a good good part of the episode. Um, but Grandpa's car. Now we love this, right? Yeah. It's a. Uh, I is it a I, star, Tim? No, it's not a star. Um, All it's, right. It's a star. I can relate to this because uh, um, I didn't. Uh, I didn't get my first car from from my my dad for a dollar, but I got my second car from my dad for a dollar. Um, my my original car. Um, was an 89 Chevy Celebrity. I loved it. I could relate to that of having your first car relate. Um, but then when that car died, my dad was like, um, I need a new car. I'll sell you my car for a dollar and I'll go get a new car. So that's what we did. <laughs> Listen, my parents sold me my first car for a thousand dollars. What is happening? <laughs> My first car, my dad told me that we were splitting. It was $1,800. So I was paying $900 for my, um, what was it? A, I think it was an 88 Ford Taurus. And it was cranberry colored outside and inside. And we called it the cranberry nightmare. Um, but when it died, he was like, I don't want a bad car. Like, I don't want an unreliable car. And my sister was about to learn to drive. So he actually bought a car for us to share that neither one of us ever owned. It was just, this is the third car. Oh, okay, well, that's fair. People can, you you two can use it. And then later yeah. on. Well, the thing I relate to with this episode is the taking away the car from the parent. Because my parents had to do that with my mom's father. Um, because he was just not well in his... Uh, probably early eighties at the time. And he was still driving. And uh, I don't, I can't remember if he got in any accidents or not, but he definitely had some driving issues and they had to take his keys away. And it was, it was horrible. Um, So this always reminded me of that. He had pretty much the same reaction as grandpa Arnold. You know, nobody, nobody wants to feel like, uh, you know, they can't do something after they've been doing it for 60 years. Yeah, I I didn't have to deal with that. Um, both my grandparents were uh, grandfathers were dead by when I was five, um, oh, wow. and grandma, um, she, I don't think she ever had her license. She lived in Philly and just took public transportation everywhere. And then my other grandma, um, she was lived in Philly area too. And then like I guess she got her license late, like after my mom. Like my mom tells me oh, story. Wow. Oh, she had her license for a little bit, but couldn't. She could only either make right turns or left turns. She struggled with one of them, so everywhere she went, she would have to make a route of <laughs> left turns or right turns to get to work and take a different route back. And eventually, like m- my memories of my grandma is like my mom always like, oh yeah, well let's go pick up grandma to take her somewhere or something like that type of thing. Oh, wow. That's so interesting. That is not my experience whatsoever. All of my grandparents drove until they were too sick to drive. It was never a, I have all my faculty. I like, you know, I'm dangerous on the road. It was just, they physically were sick. Um, But my great grandmother ran a taxi out of her house. Like she was, it was a little taxi, like you called up her house and she was the taxi for the town. She was the dispatcher. No, she was the car. She was the actual driver. Yeah, it was called Brown's Taxi Service, I think. And she would, and that was my great grandmother and her husband, that family, they owned a gas station in town like during World War II. So we didn't have any like gas rationing because they owned the gas station. So that grandmother, my grandmother knew how to drive pretty, you know, pretty well. My other grandmother, they had like a big, they had a company that had like a big truck. Both of them were, you know, all kinds of driving. So yeah, they didn't have any, there was no issues with any of that. Hopefully that's I won't cool. go through this with my own parents. Yeah, I know. That's the thing, right? We're all, we're all, we're all getting close to that age. 
Uh, all right. So let's see. Code of Chrome, we talked about. Private yeah. Butthead. Now, this better be a star, star, Tim. This is a star. All right. I knew Me this too. would be a star. Um, all right. Well, let's. So, Melissa, Tim, I'm going to actually let you talk about this episode first since you started. But Melissa and I, when we did our uh, Wonder Years new version uh, conversation for the series premiere, I had mentioned, uh, do you remember, Melissa, about this uh, episode having or this original show having a sort of Vietnam PTSD type of uh, flashback? Oh, I don't. And think so this I is when so this is when they join they decide to quit school, uh, Wart and uh, Wayne and join the uh, the the military. But Wayne can't get in. Yeah, I had and, seen this one before, and oh, thought, okay, so you remembered parts of this. Yeah, and uh, uh, I I just thought it was a good episode for for Wayne, um, because he's struggling to fit in. He's struggling with school. He doesn't know where he belongs, and then um, just decides to join the army, and it, it jacks against it. Um, and then he also he just he can't pass, and he's. So he's so heartbroken because he just feels like he can't do anything. Um, I, like it's probably one of the 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 only times so far that I've really felt sorry for Wayne. Um, like yeah. no, always, totally, I totally. I've always had like oh appreciation of him, like finally doing the right thing or showing emotions or uh, a bond to Kevin. But this is the first time I was like, oh my god, Wayne. Um, and then Jack's just comforting him type of thing it's, it's very emotional and it's, it's very heartwarming is this I the one correct me if i'm wrong is this the one where they're on the roof and jack is telling kevin uh about wayne's resilience right yeah, yeah. where he's like oh you know wayne you know wayne didn't walk or whatever for you know whatever and then as soon as he did he sprinted across the room and then he you know when he fell he got got right back like i thought that was a great speech and i think it does give us a whole new perspective on wayne as a character right yeah and it also gives us a uh perspective of how jack handles wayne yeah well yeah interesting point. of what they expect from wayne and so i think wayne also kind of i don't say he lives up to the expectations but he's kind of like i uh, he, he knows that people recognize these weaknesses mm -hmm. um and i actually kind of thought if it weren't wartime it probably was a good idea for him to um possibly go into the military because i think he is one of those people who would have been okay being like yes i can take an order you know what i mean like right i, I don't think it was necessarily the wrong move for him but i mean this was vietnam we're like just throwing people on the front line and what you know it, it was right. terrible so um i'm very curious to see i can't remember what wayne actually ends up doing and you've seen the end do we find out don't tell yeah. me what it is but um yeah he 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 forges a career path in season six okay yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think this is the best one of the season, Tim. I, I'm totally with yeah. you on it. I, I this is probably it's the first one I starred, um, and I, I do think it's also interesting in Jack's viewpoint of Vietnam at this point. Like because in season two, like with uh, Karen's boyfriend type of thing, it would just seem like uh, he would be in favor of Vietnam at that point. I kind of feel like that was kind of his, his viewpoint, right? In that yeah. episode. Yeah, but, yeah, absolutely. And then now it's shifted where I don't think he like it doesn't, he's not like anti-Vietnam, but it's like he knows the the realistic facts of that if Wayne goes, joins the army, he could, he'll probably go to Vietnam and he might not come home. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and Dan Laurie, of course, is a Vietnam vet, you know, himself. So obviously, I'm sure that influenced uh, the, the character's perspective a little bit, too. But yeah, I just I love that one. Um, all right. So uh, of Mastodons and Men is next. Um, this is with Kevin and the uh, the girlfriend. And uh, we have the um, 
what the Fer- the dad from Ferris Bueller is uh, the father of the girlfriend and they have like a whole I mean he's completely whipped and all of this um this to me Tim you mentioned a sort of sitcom angle to uh, one of the other episodes this to me was like straight out of the sitcom playbook Melissa's nodding her head she knows um <laughs> this might might be well there's a few bad ones this is definitely like bottom three or four this season for me though this is just like it's so corny but i do sort of like the resolution of it all yeah i i do like the the last line by the 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 dad where like where he was i don't know exactly but he was just kind of like yeah you just once you find the right person or something like that, it, it's it's worth it or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was it was funny. I agree. Very sitcom, um, you know, throwaway episode. But I, I, I liked that there were a few episodes that like made me laugh and I thought this was one of them. Um, yeah, I wonder if like they were getting notes from ABC to be like, let's just do more episodes that have nothing to do with anybody else in the show no through lines, Frank and Denise the Grease, like, because, I mean, we never have heard of this girl. We never see her again. Um, so I, I don't know, well, sort of a sort of a throwaway episode, but I agree. It had some laughs. I, I mean, that, that's typical Kevin relationship where it's like he all of a sudden it's like, oh, he's kind of dating this one girl or he, he's interested in this one girl. It's just like it, it. I didn't think that part of it was really out of the out of left field no i guess that's true i guess i feel like in high school though you sort of usually do get your your girlfriends or boyfriends from sort of your kind of inner circle like it's not like seinfeld where every single week you know you're dating some random person but yeah yeah, no i i I agree i mean it makes sense i I think that's the magic of television issue um because they're not uh employing the same extras every week and so yeah they're, and they want to make sure they do have somebody who can act when they're doing some of these. So you have to suspend a little bit of like, you kind of have to assume, oh, this person was in the periphery, I feel. Well, and um, again, Winnie was barely in the season. So I guess they had to do something to fill sort of that romance gap. Yeah. Um, but so Winnie is, is definitely in the next one. This is the double, double date. Um, they, they start, they're, they're on a double date with other people and then they end up leaving because uh, Kevin and Winnie can't can't stop fighting. Um, yeah, you had mentioned this one uh, earlier. Somebody did, Tim. I think uh, I, I completely forgot about this episode. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, there you go, Melissa. Maybe mentioned it. But well, I thought this episode was such uh, such a big deal because this is the coming back. Yeah, yeah this is how they got together from the previous season where we hadn't. We, we definitely weren't really together. We had the whole, I love you. But again, I don't, I agree with whoever said that that was just sort of a, you know, I'm still, I'm still here. I'm still your friend. I, I still love you that way, but this is you know, right. not doing anything. Um, I thought that this was really, we've, I mean, it's almost like a whole year has gone by. So they've really grown up, grown up. And so I thought the like, romantic tension was really pretty palpable and interesting to watch. Um, I missed Winnie. Yeah. I don't want to say I missed Winnie because I don't love Winnie. Well, but I did like this But you you get so used to this character that she's gone for, you know, the first 12 episodes of the season. Yeah, I I I I like this episode. I thought the the guy that Winnie was dating was hilarious. Of oh yeah, he was great. Where he was like, What's your top four favorite colors? Or like he, <laughs> questions i i love that um and then the, i had the... a friend who on first dates she would come up with 10 questions to ask people in case things lagged i guarantee i know who that is <laughs> um, okay I, I just thought uh the the way that the winnie and and kevin were like they kind of set each other up because they were friends but then when they were driving together on the double date they just kind of like they knew so much about each other that they were like just throwing each other's faces and using it as ammunition and i i thought the tension there was definitely leading to where it led which was them yeah. getting back together but then we got uh, all right five episodes 
So up next, we've got Hero. Uh, this is a, another pretty good Jack episode, really. Um, and but at, the center, at the center, of course, Tim, is our Lord Jesus Christ, Jim Caviezel. <laughs> yep. Our and Lord and Savior. It is my second starred episode. I yeah, didn't I mean, even look, realize that was him until you started saying that. And I was like, wait, James Caviezel, what? Yeah, I actually didn't recognize it, but I saw his name in the credits. And I was like, wait, that same James Caviezel we know? Um, so it makes sense. He's sort of the, the, you know, the basketball hero here, very tall and, and gorgeous. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, Tim, we all know the Jack episodes are among the best. Yep. Uh, this is a great one because here's another one where Kevin's really trying to, um, assert himself as a, an independent adult. And like, you know, I think Jack comes up with this really great plan because Kevin was struggling in, in math and so he can't go to the game or whatever. And so he's like, okay, I'll take you to the game. Let's see what the fuss is all about. And as an adult, I think, wow, that is a really good, you know. Uh, I was literally suggesting this. I'm like, just take him to the game. Yeah, like, it's, I mean, it's why is this perfect, an issue? And then he said it. It's, it's, it's a perfect uh, go between. And as a 15, 16 year old kid, I would have been like, F that, this stinks, like that, 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 that. So I saw it from both their perspectives. And I was certainly, I had a couple of, you know, real jerk ass moments uh, where I, you know, sort of cut my dad down, I guess, in front of my friends. Um, and I just, I love the way this episode came together. Yeah. And uh, the, the way, like, the, where, uh, what's his name? Jesus? Who, what is his name? Yeah, uh, Jesus. Our Lord Jesus Christ, Joe. No, no, no. He has what a name. Bobby Jim Riddle. Riddle. Bobby Riddle. Oh, in the game, I, I don't know what his name is. Bob. Bobby. Bobby uh, Riddle. Yeah, so the way that Bobby was portrayed in the beginning of the episode where he was just kind of like, he like Kevin thought he was cool by association and Bobby knew Kevin's name because they had lockers right next to each other. Um, I thought that was very, like, kind of realistic for high school. And then when... They finally spoiler alert, lose the game, and he's no longer the hero. How he quickly turns on Kevin, and he like like the curtain drops, and you see the the wizard behind the curtain, and you're like, okay, he's not a hero. And how Jack is finds out like he now sees Jack as the hero, and how um, type of thing. How about the end, Tim? When he says, when Jack says, like you know, it's not easy to be the hero. Yeah. What a, what a good line. I stand corrected. I think about whatever I said earlier. I think this probably is my favorite of the season. Another great Jack episode. Melissa, you love this one? I don't think I love it that much, but that's because I... Maybe it's not, a father-son only uh, show. I think it's a father-son thing, first okay. of all. And I think it's also an episode. And I think this is, this is probably more specific to me. I was never one of those people who idolized sports figures, famous people, anything like that. The people who were like, when they were like, write about your hero, I would write about my parents. Like I so. would too. I would write about my mother all the time, which, you know, I don't know. But um, I, yeah, I mean, I certainly, and I didn't go to any, any games, you know, sporting events when I was in high school or anything, but just that tension between him and Jack and then, um, uh, you know, sort of Jack, um, allowing Kevin to kind of treat him like garbage for a little bit to sort of prove a point. Um, I feel like that's, you know, my dad probably did that exact same stuff. Yeah, My dad um, would never have let us treat him like garbage. And I think that maybe. Is no, he wouldn't. No, he would not have. Um, I don't remember having any interactions with my dad like that. Um, I, I do know that my, my, my sister got in like some type of, uh, she hurt her foot and she had concert tickets to go see Stone Temple Pilots, but she was on crutches now. And my mom, I'll take you. Um, so she went to see Stone Temple Pilots with my sister on crutches uh, because that's the type of mom that she is. Wow. Right? And I know Susie. She is a huge, huge STP fan. <laughs> <laughs> um. So it kind of reminded me of like type of thing that that would happen. Like, um, yeah, like, 
Yeah, par- I, yeah. I, I, I think just, this I is something it. that we have to like be a parent to be able to be like, well, that's just what you do for your kids. Yeah. Kind of thing. So yeah. I think this will be, I think, I think maybe when we have a different perspective, we might feel differently. Um, yeah, I would say that's probably true. I'm, I'm sure I probably have a different perspective now watching this episode than I did 30 years ago. Um, all right. So lunch stories is next. Um, I had seen this, this one before and it's, I, again, I think it's a kind of funny. I enjoyed it. Yeah. A very funny episode. It's a complete bottle episode. The whole thing takes place in the school, mostly in the cafeteria. Is this the first time we see good old Seth Green? I, I think the so. First, the right? first. Okay. Because he's in a couple of other episodes. I couldn't remember if this was the very first time we saw him. But yeah, he plays, uh, I forget, Jimmy or something. The 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 cool kid that wants to ditch. Uh, Jimmy Donnelly. And, and Jimmy Donnelly. Yeah, there it is. Um, and Winnie kind of saves the day at the end of this one, Melissa. I actually loved that. Because I, I really didn't want to see, I didn't really want to see Kevin get in trouble for this stupidity, right. basically. Um, I actually was more enjoying uh, Paul trying to get that kid's name yeah um, wayne going and, over for the but i bucks. loved winnie at the end and she didn't even know she was saving the day though she had no idea that was inadvertent um i don't think that's true really yeah because think about it kevin never hangs out with these kids he's clearly about to leave in the middle of the school day i i think she did i think she knew exactly what she was doing Tim, what impression like, did you get from that? Um, I think kind of both. I mean, like, he's clearly getting berated by the principal when when I, he steps out. I think that. I mean, I think maybe she's like kind of, but I don't. I don't know. He had already said, "Yeah, I'm going to help you out." So yeah, I think. I guess that's it, true. I think it was just kind of right place, right time for Winnie. Um, and then also, I think she's smart enough to realize that Kevin is getting in trouble to possibly ditch. And I think she's also smart enough to know that she needs blood and that she can get four people to donate blood right in this situation. That's true. Yeah. I, I think all of that's true. Uh, yeah, this was a fun one. I mean, again, you know, it doesn't really attach to anything else, but that's fine. All right, so Carnal Knowledge is next, and Melissa watched this movie in prep uh, after uh, hearing so many things about it. I didn't know if it was a real movie, and when I looked it up and it was, I just, I had to see what it was all about. It's about 90 minutes, so if you decide you want uh, to... 90 minutes of your life yeah with, famous. Uh, where where'd you watch it was it on a streaming site or something it is i believe it is free to stream if you have amazon prime i want to say okay. so prime Very members good. go enjoy uh this is directed by um mike nichols and his um stars jack nicholson and art garfunkel of all people <laughs> um who's only had like 11 roles as an actor. Um, That's Garfunkel, Tim, from Simon and Garfunkel. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which I was, uh, he, he's credited as Arthur Garfunkel, but as soon as you see him, you know it's him. Um, right. They went on and on about Anne Margaret being in this, but I really, it's three vignettes over, like it, it, it's 10 years apart. And the first person is Candace Bergen, who is the main lead. Then we have Anne Margaret, then we have some throwaway people, but they're famous people. It's like uh, Carol Kane and Rita Moreno. So it's oh, wow. very interesting. I felt like I was watching the inner circle of what it must be to be a guy and have friends, but also have friends who are horrible people. So huh. Okay. Um, well, there's a couple of parallels with, with uh, Kevin sometimes with that, I guess. Some of his oh, friends well, are horrible. Well, not like that horrible when um, you decide to watch it. Um, and I understand, so they're they're talking about the, the erotic scenes. There's not much yeah. to see. There's a little tiny bit of nudity in, I want to say, the second vignette. But it's mostly about talking about what people are doing, what, what they will do and what they're willing to do and things like that. Uh, by well, today's somebody standards... Did something, somebody did something in this episode that I think was a bit mind-blowing. Yes, it's all about, right? I mean, that's, I mean, the, the name of the episode, the name of the movie, Carnal Knowledge, I think you know where, what the theme is either way here. 
Yeah. My husband uh, had to, totally knew what I was talking about when I said this episode. He was like, oh, yeah, that's when. And yeah, I, I mean, know- it's it's pretty famous. Tim, uh, I mean, were you were you shocked by the ending of this episode? Paul's being a jerk the whole time. He, he's with this um, older woman. And then we find out that he loses his virginity to her. Kevin's a real jerk to him about it, the whole thing. Um, I don't know if I was super shocked when it happened because of how it, how things started with the, at the lake um he's the one who had the condom in his wallet he that like, is true like um it doesn't surprise me that much because of that well um, he's kind of gone through puberty first he had the growth spurt the deep voice yeah, yeah. that's true right physically he's certainly a couple of years ahead of kevin yeah and i feel like he is a little bit smarter with his relationships because um, he like he was with that girl Carla before Kevin got a girlfriend like and he's some he stayed with her for a decent amount of time I feel like um, well he's a pragmatic individual whereas Kevin is much more um, just doing things off the cuff and rash you know a little more irrational I feel like yeah. And uh, I, I I thought the the way it ended was uh, was good. I thought uh, of Paul like just com- like it understandably about like this this girl is now out of his life and he has no idea like information that he needs of like was he good like type of things like he's like I don't I don't know how to process this and that's totally Paul. Um, yeah. And of course, Kevin is totally Kevin and doesn't understand and makes it all about him. Yeah. Well, and wanting all the details. Labs it to everyone. That's, that's yeah. actually that whole like, oh, what was it like? That's basically what the other movie is about. My husband actually is convinced that Paul didn't consent to this whole thing and that it's 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 a kind of a what? non-consensual storyline i don't want to use the r word but huh. yeah i i never i never got that impression i don't think he watched it with me so i'm not sure this is this may be just be remembering but yeah okay uh all right so lost weekend is next this is the poker poker party that uh, Ke- that kevin plans that turns into uh the the party of the century um that's a little sitcom but i just i love uh, at the end of this, when the the house is trashed, Wayne, who was away the entire night, wasn't even a part of this, uh, takes the blame from uh, because it's assumed that it was you know his deal, and he just he takes it. It's it's his it's his lot in life, and he says, yeah, okay, um, you know, whatever. Um, how, how did you feel about the end of this episode, guys? Melissa, did you? Uh, I don't know how bad for Wayne. it was because I wouldn't, I don't think I would have taken the rap. Um, but I love the fact that Wayne knows he's like, they're not gonna, like, what are they going to do? Like, right. They he just doesn't care. Anyway. He's like, they, they, you know, they assume it was me. <laughs> yeah. So, And I think his line, like, didn't he say that, like, something about, like, they, it's not even worth the effort to try to explain it because, like, I don't think they would believe him anyway. Like, yeah, yeah, he, and, and it's I I completely see that. I mean, obviously he is kind of the the screw up and whatever. Um, yeah, it, it's totally convincing. But again, kind of a nice Wayne thing, you know. He didn't even try to really protest it. Yeah, it's a, another great Wayne moment. I feel like usually you have one gr- Wayne great moment per season but i feel like we've got three we've got three this season and i feel like that that's great yeah i feel like now that he's really coming into his own as more than just a jerky brother he's actually becoming an adult you know and uh yeah i i love that they've written these more i don't know more uh interesting things to say about him yeah, not that they're still than, not calling each other names and beating each other up, which I'm assuming not having many brothers, you're still doing. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, we 
bust each other's chops all the time. I mean, you've met my brother. He just texts me random things all the time just to like irritate me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, the, 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 the scrote talk this season is down a bit um for 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 uh wayne so yeah I, I don't know but yes i agree i think we got three really great wayne episodes this season uh, all right so then i wanted to say now i'm trying to remember exactly oh, which yeah, episode it was but it was something about how they're always saying um how he's always saying butthead and i was thinking back to something with back to the future and then how kind of he kind of reminds me of Biff a lot. Yeah. And you had not made the Wayne uh, connection with Back to the Future. Oh, that's what it was. Now I remember. Yes. Yeah. You had texted Tim and I. And I thought we talked about it on, on this show. But Tim Tim reminded me we talked about it on one of the Dan Does Disney when we talked about Davy Crockett. Uh, how popular. He's wearing, he's wearing the coonskin hat. And he's yeah. like, what are reruns? Yeah, and per- and perfect era for it because 1955. As soon as Marty McFly gets into town, Davy Crockett's playing on the radio. Um, so uh, yes, so he plays Lorraine's younger brother, who I don't know if he has a name. Um, it's not Jailbird Joey because he's the baby. Yeah, but um, but anyway, so, yes. So classic yeah, once to rerun back to the future. Yes. Um, all right, so. The, the other episodes of the season we already talked about. Stormy Weather, The Wedding, those were the Schwimmer episodes. Back to the Lake, and then Broken Hearts and Burgers. Winnie and Kevin I did are fighting, watch it this time. But it's basically a, you know, a uh, clip show. Tim's favorite. I mean, it is a clip show. This one has a plot, though. This one had way plot. more of a skeleton to it. Yeah. yeah. I feel like the last clip show that we had wasn't a clip show. It was kind of like... Like I felt like it was like the end of a uh, the the series. It was like this series retrospective. Thing. Yeah, it wasn't like, good. A retrospective, and I thought that was interesting. Where this one has a plot, and I feel like opposed to clip shows of like Friends. Friends has a clip shows every season where they aren't important. I feel like this one is important. The 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 little plot that you have. Like, I'm assuming, I don't know season six, but this is getting Kevin and Winnie officially back together um, and that they are 100% in love for each other. Right. If they break uh, up over the summer, I'm going to be real mad all right, because well, we'll, I want to we'll see figure them that at out. least a, a little bit longer, even though I know they don't end up together and that's not a spoiler, like, that everyone knows that. I do want them to have a little Tim more time. Didn't know that? What do you? We don't know that that happened. We it's don't know what's ev- going to happen. Everywhere Tim? online, it says. Tim, oh, I don't know any. Okay, Tim's I'm never sorry. even heard of this show until I mentioned it. All right, so right. we don't know that. No more spoilers now, <laughs> Tim. We don't know what happens to him. They okay. could. They could not. Tim, we don't. You're know. very naive. Naive. If you thought that was happening. Listen. I, sometimes we don't know what people know. Remember, I know Tim. I didn't expect that to be where it's going. Um, Tim, remember when uh, I showed Joe, Thelma, and Louise, and beforehand I was like, well, we all know what happens. Stuff that I, he had no idea what happened in Thelma and Louise, and I, I just, that blew my mind. All right, I guess this that is seems my like sort of every day. people situation. So, I'm right. sorry, Tim. Tim, we don't know anything. But, I uh, mean, no, the, but it's not Thelma and Louise that you're ruining. It's like... Uh, all right, but the point is, uh, yes, this clip show was better, um, but let's grade this season. I think uh, once again, we've had uh, a couple of real standouts, but less less so uh, than other seasons. I leave season four with a B. Tim? I was not ex- season five. No. Oh, season five. I'm sorry. Season four, we already did. Season five. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> and four, we left it at an A minus. Is that where we kind of all consensus? Uh. I don't remember. I thought maybe it was a B plus. I was going one under season four. Mm, I don't know. Now I can't remember. Tim, you usually remember that stuff more than I do. Um, I might. I might have been at, at a B plus. Um, oh, maybe I you and like, I were A minus. I feel a like plus. I was at an A minus because I had had lower expectations. I was going to give this a B plus. Okay, I really then yeah. Had- I agree now. If that's the truth, Tim, I think you're right. 
Melissa, you and I were A minus. I'm B plus on this one then. Yeah, I'm going to go B plus as well. I had very low expectations going in, but then at the end, I was like, okay, that wasn't as bad as I thought. I didn't hate it. I wasn't in love with any of it. I'm very concerned about season six. Great character development for Wayne. Uh, good Jack episodes again. Um, I, w- I would give it a B. Um, that I feel like it's because I think I gave season one and two B pluses, and then get out of here, Tim. And then season three, and maybe I did go with A minus, but I'm going to give this one a B because yes, there's some great episodes, but it's it's still all enjoyable, but it's 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 a B. I think you're always a hair under us. Yeah, because I think Melissa, you and I probably gave season three an A. I mean, that's the best. I absolutely remember giving. I didn't give anything an A plus. And Any criers was... this, this season? Did I cry? I cried at the hero episode. I think uh, that was I don't the know. This was though. last week. It was hard, hard to remember now. I think I think that was the only one uh, I, I, I might cried have about cried this time. At the uh, private butthead. Mm, yeah, I might have cried at that one too. That was I think good. when I think oh. when uh, Wart gets on the bus and he's leaving, and then he goes, and then they say how he's. He, he was, you know, basic training six weeks, and then he was on the front line infantry. He was yeah. God. And Wayne lost his best friend. I mean, he, that, that was his best friend, you know, the, the first person to understand Wayne, and he leaves and uh, goes off to war. Um, all right. So uh, we'll have season six, the final wrap for the Wonder Years um, at some point, I guess, probably in December. Uh, any final other final thoughts on season five? I mean, it's That's... it's watching if you've never seen the Wonder Years like me. Um, this is a it's 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 still worth watching. All right, good, Tim. I'm glad you feel that way. Not a chore. A good <laughs> good show. Only that we all like. Not a chore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's good watching, but when when it's like, oh, I have to watch a a full season in in a week, I'm just like, I should have been all right. Doing- by homework. I'm sorry that we had a lot of deadlines and uh, I was trying to cram one more in there. That's um, all right. But now uh, we've got a lot. You got to you got like six weeks, hopefully. <laughs> if- yeah, the the we have about a month and a half before the end of the year. So let's knock this out for season six. Uh, everybody, thank you for watching. Melissa, thank you for being here, of course. Thank you, Tim. Always a pleasure. We're going to see you very, very soon on Dan Does Disney. So good seeing you. Always. All right. Bye, everybody.